I first heard of DMT in 1966 when I was a freshman at the University of California at Santa Cruz. And, um, you know, that was the beginning of that era. And uh, I remember I was on my way into a harpsichord concert that had already started. And a friend said, here, this is a very special joint. Smoke this one. And uh, we did and then walked into... Uh, you know, a beautiful storm of harpsichord notes that were moving and dancing with the, the parent individual and collective will. Um, and so that was my, it was apparently marijuana laced with a little DMT. And then um, I didn't encounter it again for years until um, I was offered a pipe full of the pure substance and that was 1975. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, when you first heard about it, was there anything specific that you heard, or was it, did you kind of go into this blindly when you first heard about it, or were there some experiences that you heard from others, or some stories, or? Well, that first time that I just described was just happenstance and um, experimentation. Uh, the second time was um, with uh, the fellow who would later be my husband, Terrence McKenna, and he had been, I'd known him for some years already, and he had been talking about it, and um, basically it was our first date. And he said, you know, sort of the I don't, ticket, I guess, in a way, you know, let's see where you go and what you feel about it, and, um, and prepared me for uh, not the content, really, but the, the force and the scope. And... Um, and it was even much more than it was presented as. I mean, Terrence, you know, half tongue in cheek, wrote the foreword to to the psilocybin mushroom growers guide, saying, you know, the mushroom's intelligence and it has in intelligence, it has information about how to build technologies and and uh, and things like that. But if you really have to, if you really think about the, the whole SETI thing and the, you know, uh, 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 communication with extraterrestrial intelligence and all the efforts to detect radio signals, uh, you know, from an advanced civilization, I mean, the premises that surround that idea are so naive. It's almost embarrassing, you know, the notion that an extremely advanced technological civilization would even bother with radio, you know, is just silly. No, it's, it ain't going to come that way, or it may come that way, but there's lots of ways that it may come. And I've actually read speculations where people have said, well, you know, you could build and a message into DNA, which would not be detected uh, until the civilization had reached the point where they could do molecular biology, they could sequence these things, and they could see, you know, that there's actually a, a meaningful sequence of information there. Well, how about make DMT? Yeah, turn the N-methyltransferase on and make a compound that when you take it shows you machines and starships and aliens and weird cities and all this stuff. I mean, what could be what could be less ambiguous? There's no mystery. That is the message. And the remarkable feature of that is about 70% of our people at two months say that this experience is among the five most personally meaningful experiences of their lives. About 70% say it's among the five most spiritually meaningful experiences of their life. 30% of this group that had, they were, they were uh, spiritually interested people. They were people uh, that had uh, 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 some kinds of ongoing interests in spiritual practice. 30% of the group said it was the single most spiritually significant experience of their life. And, and so for me as a psychopharmacologist sitting down with someone 
two months after a session and then saying, you know, this is the most, I mean, a number of them said, this is the most personally meaningful experience of my life. Well, the impact of that particular introduction um, that I just described, uh, it was significant, but I think I had already, I had already recognized that my life was going to be about looking at these realms, that it was, a, that I was a psychedelic seeker and there was no other path. There were many ways to take that path. And um, I, I would think that that first uh, DMT experience uh, just even broadened, further broadened the terms and the realm and the uh, ways, the possible ways of seeing things. So um, I do recall that for a couple of weeks after, I, I had to go back to my life and work um, immediately after that. And I remember just saying over and over to myself, I can't believe it, I can't believe it. And, uh, but I knew I could believe it. And, and so it was sort of like, um, it was an initiation. It was an initiation to another level of what I thought I was already up to my eyebrows in. <laughs> All of it is about sharing visions, and so it all starts with drawing, you know, and, uh, well, really starts with altering your consciousness so that you have a vision in some sense. And so from, because con consciousness is the ultimate medium, what you're trying to do as an artist is to have an experience that is worth sharing, and then download it into another person's consciousness you know and if it were just mind to mind uh, that would be a wonderful thing but you have to get it out of your head and into a medium so that it can be shared and the most frictionless transmission of these dynamic visions is often through computer animation i still love painting my work is completely changed by my psychedelic experiences. My, my opening in my work came out of uh, experiencing an essentialized worldview. And that was made up of three elements that I experienced through psychedelics. That was chaos, which is the world that we call reality, that we live in, where all beings and things are separate and made of different materials. and you know, and, there, and everything is an entropy, everything's falling apart. Then there's order, which is the psychedelic experience or the meditative experience where all things are, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> where all things are, are interconnected and all beings and things are one. And the light of love flows through all beings and things. So that's order. And then there's secret writing. There's uh, a lot of people claim to see secret writing when they're using psychedelics, but I see it, and I see it as a symbol of the place where inner order becomes outer chaos. Um, you know, we can argue about how metaphorical this reality may be, which is fine, but that reality is definitely a metaphor, um, as I see it. You know, and that I think that the trap, that the danger is to see it as real, is to see the way in which we choose to understand that experience as the experience. So, you know, okay, we go out and I saw the alien elves and crystal creatures, and they're really, really there. Well, what if the alien crystal creatures is a really great way of understanding, a really great way of remembering what it was, this sense that the universe is a trickster, that the universe has these moments that, that things work out, that the universe is winking at us. What better way than to see little characters winking at us? Hey, yeah, it was it would figure that that my experience would have men in black. They, all right, they were literally men in black. They were guys in suits that were accompanying 
Dr. Strassman. They were quote unquote colleagues. But as far as I could see, they had black suits on. They didn't have sunglasses on, but they were glasses. They were scribbling in their little notebooks and they weren't care. They didn't care at all about the blood samples and stuff like that. But as soon as I talk, started talking science fiction stories and stuff, they were like, writing in their notes. They, they claimed to be like psychologists from Florida. They had a cover story, but they were kind of smarmy, very official. That it is mankind's earliest documentation of contact with supernatural realms and beings. Uh, contact which requires the individual concerned to be in an altered state of consciousness in, in order to have it. And then you have to, then, then really I began to think, if this is the case, and we and we also find that it is connected to a to a huge leap forward in every other aspect of, of, of human behavior, then maybe maybe it's possible that that instead of being demonic and dangerous and harmful to human beings as we're taught today overwhelmingly in our society, perhaps experiences in altered states of consciousness are in fact nurturing and, and positive, and it may even be that that we owe our very humanity. Uh, to those to those experiences, and I think that's the importance of the of, of the cave art and the new analysis of cave art. That it that it that it is sooner or later going to force us to to reconsider our attitudes to to almost everything. It, it might not be too far fetched to say that that in the society that we live in today, which is so negative about such experiences, we, by accepting that negativity, we may be denying ourselves the next step forward in our own evolution. And uh, this was one of my most powerful experiences ever, if not the most powerful experience. Uh, uh, what happened there is uh, actually when I took uh, the last drag from the, or the second drag actually from the from the pipe, uh, the current uh, reality just completely, completely disappeared. Uh, Christina and some uh, friends who were with me uh, said that I was sitting there uh, like a sculpture just holding the, the pipe, it just wasn't there. And unlike in my previous experiences, there were no, there was nothing biographical, nothing perinatal, no archetypes. Uh, I just went directly into um, an experience that I can best describe as uh, Dharmakaya, the uh, Tibetan Book of the Dead, uh, the sense of all of existence being present just at this incredible source of light, but you know, it doesn't do it justice to call it light. I mean, it was extremely radiant, uh, incandescent uh, source of light, but at the same time there was a sense that uh, it's like all of creation was there in, a, in just a pure potential form. Uh, there was a state that seemed to transcend all uh, polarities. It seemed uh, it brought like the understanding of existence of a kind that uh, you know you just cannot do, cannot get to the usual usual means. Between the inhalation and the exhalation, they were then transported into you know whatever it is or wherever it is that DMT leads people. It facilitates the entering and exiting of the soul in the body. I would have expected that I would see angels and fairies and not alien life forms. Are these experiences spiritual experiences or otherwise are they created by physiological processes or, or is the brain itself responding to something that's going on? When you trip that first time you realize that the frames we use to understand our world are arbitrary. DMT is a forcible reminder that there's a lot more about reality, the universe, ourselves, the biosphere, whatever, that we, uh, there's a lot more to it than we, than we imagine. I need